thank you, Jahid, um, for giving me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's figure it out. Hello, hello. Is there sound audible right now? Hello, is there audible sound right now? Is it, is it fine now? The sound problem is uh, solved. Has been so, solved. Okay, yeah. So okay. We, we switched over your presentation. So okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you, Jahir, for giving me this opportunity to talk to everyone and um, to all of you. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, for whatever it is and for which part of the world you are in right now. And um, so uh, I am not accustomed to giving webinars and. I mean, this is the new normal now we have to switch somehow and so that I, 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 do, I don't have any interaction with the audiences and I don't know if they're even following me or uh, I have missed some point if someone is not understanding something and moreover I will not be getting direct questions from the audience. So what I have done is like segregate my talk in three parts and in between these parts I will have a quick uh, pause where uh, before that you write your questions and I will try to answer those questions in those pauses and at the end I will again answer your questions so that's it and so now I'm like going to my talk so as the title says I will be talking about the magnetic monopoles and which we some the people who are doing physics, uh, most of them already know that uh, there cannot be any magnetic monopole. But I will give you an overview of how you can actually have magnetic monopole behavior in your system. And for that, so let's start with the good old Maxwell's equation. Oh, sorry, not, not, not this guy, this guy. So 
these are the Maxwell's equations, as you know, and I, they, so these are, these are one of the most beautiful equations in math in physics, where you can see that the electric field and the electricity and magnetism have been combined, and uh, they brought out they, they, it was brought out as a as a unified theory of electromagnetics. And the first one is uh, is the normal Gauss law. And there are these four equations which actually tell you the how spatially and um, temporally your time, uh, your electric field and magnetic field behaves. And uh, the people who already know the Maxwell's equation, they know that I have made something wrong in these equations. This term and this term is not there in the Maxwell's equation. However, the other two terms are exactly as the Maxwell's equations, and and these, the so the first equation is tells you that the divergence of electric field is proportional to your charge in the system, or the, the charge you have, and the curl of the magnetic field has a electric current in the. It depends upon the electric current. So why so? So if you go ahead and look close into a material, you you can you can go to the atomic level, and now you have an atom, and you know that your atom has positively charged particles in the nucleus, and that is being surrounded by a negatively charged uh, electrons. And these are your elementary particles. These elementary particles have charge in the electric charge inside them. And when you have a have a, a conductor where you have these electric charges and you apply a field across them, then you know that the electric these charges move, and that's how you get your current. However, these terms are not present in these two equations. Like you don't have a magnetic charge like here, or you don't have a magnetic current. And the reason is what you have learned in your school days that there is no magnetic monopole. So if you take, uh, take a bar magnet and you try to cut it and try to divide your two North Pole and South Pole, you don't get to do that. You, you always uh, get a pair of I, you always get your North Pole and South Pole stuck together. You can't separate a North Pole from a South Pole. And this also comes from your atomic picture. So you cut the magnet as much as you can, and finally you reach uh, uh, reach an atom. And now when you uh, look at it, you see that the magnets are coming from the electrons itself. And the electrons have a spin. And this spin somewhat behaves like a magnet. So your your spin always has is behaves like a dipole. It has a north pole and a south pole. You you can't divide this south pole and north pole from the electron. And as you can't do it, this uh, this dipole as as your elementary uh, elementary thing is a dipole, you can never separate a North Pole from South Pole, and uh, I mean, if if you want to um, discuss more about how the spin thing comes in an electron, that's that's a whole uh, whole uh, lot of discussion. But for our purpose, we will believe that the electrons have a spin, and that can be plus half or minus half or something like that. So the bottom line is, you uh, uh, the elementary particle that you have is itself a dipole. So that could, could be end of the talk because then we have proof that there could not be any elementary monopole. But we physicists, we like to give things a thought and we have our new novel ideas and one of those ideas say that, okay, fine, you're mo you cannot get an elementary monopole, but it's possible that you can get a monopole as an emergent particle. So this might be a new term to the new uh, students of physics who don't understand what an emergent particle is. I, I'm going to explain, elaborate on that a bit. 
So what is the emergent particle? So basically emergent particle is a mathematical concept, is a mathematical tool that will allow you to analyze your system easily or in a better way. For example, I will give uh, you uh, one or two examples and I'll tell you that you already know what a emergent particle is, but maybe no one ever mentioned it as a emergent particle. So let's say we have, we know the electrons have a very specific mass, very specific charge, and it also has a spin. But now when you look into a, a solid, you know, this solid has a lot of electrons. And I would say this number of electrons would be 10 to the power 23 electrons in a system almost. I mean, uh, so this 10 to the power 23 comes from the Avogadro number. So you say, OK, I have five grams of this. That will be something multiplied by 10 to the power 23 atoms. And so almost 10 to the power 23 electrons. The, the problem is this. When you try to solve it, now you have to take into account that one electron can talk all the other 10 to the power 23 minus one electrons. And that gives you a very, very complicated problem. And when you have such a problem, what you try to do is to model the system in, su in such a way that you can solve it. And one of these models is called Hubbard model. And I'm only going to talk about insulators, but the Howard model has different extents, but I can only talk about insulators. So the Hubbard model says that suppose you have a system, you, you, you have a block where there are electrons, but the electron density is not very high. You have only a few electron in a, in a, in a big uh, chunk of system where your electron can move very freely. And as an insulator, we would say that the electrons can't move around, the, the electrons don't move around a lot. They are mostly stuck in the atom they are right now in. So if, if in contrast, if you had a conductor, I would say that the electrons are, can hop a lot. But in an insulator, the electrons don't hop a lot. And for that, we um, say that, okay, so my hopping, I have a hopping amplitude, which is basically, I would say the hopping probability, which I, I which people uh, denote by T. And there is another thing that when there are two electrons coming in the same atom, we have a Coulomb repulsion between them, which I define by U. And in an insulator, U would be much, much greater than T because my hopping possibility is really low. So this thing is called Hubbard model. So now in the Hubbard model, we have all the all the uh, properties of electron. It, it's charge, it's uh, um, say it's uh, Coulomb, it's, it's charge which comes in, in the form of the Coulomb repulsion and uh, it spins and everything we have in the Hubbard model. And now, then it's a problem which is very simple and the people who know a second order perturbation theory can actually uh, do a second order perturbation on this model and they can go to a model which is called a Heisenberg model and this is Heisenberg so this Heisenberg model now in the Heisenberg model when you see it you understand that now you only have the spins of the electrons interacting with each other that was that is actually very am amazing fact you started with a model where you had hopping and electron electron repulsion but now you end up in a model where the spins the only the spins interact so basically you started with the with the electron with all its properties and now the only thing that matters is a particle with a spin so that's an emergent particle you start with the electron you've got some other particle which, which does have nothing but spin. And where do this, all these things, U, T, its charge, they go in? They go in, in defining this J, which is basically a, a, a number. A, um, I would say it's a number. It's basically a uh, energy scale that sets, sets in. 
तो यू टी आर गोइंग इन टू रीडिफाइनिंग जे वेर एज द मेन इंटरक्शन नाउ बिटवीन द टू इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इज वाई आर देयर इलेक्ट्रॉनिक स्पेन्स नथिंग एल्स तो दिस इज वन शॉर्ट ऑफ एन एग्जाम्पल ऑफ इमरजेंट पार्टिकल द अदर थिंग यू कैन थिंक ऑफ इज इफ यू ट्राई टू कैलकुलेट ओ सॉरी आई दिस शुड बी अ स्मॉल के so the the dispersion of the electron in a in a solid and i think you you already know that it come turns out to be something like this where the bottom the the, the denominator is called the effective electronic mass so you has, it's it is also a example of emergence so you had a uh, had a electron which had a specific mass but now inside inside the solid when it tries to move it has it feels some kind of a of a drag or something pulls it behind it somehow feels massive and that's why you get this effective electron mass and as far as i know in all of the cases uh, your effective electronic mass is greater than the true electronic mass so maybe a uh, or a one or two orders of magnitude I, I, i don't know so this is another example of a emergence that you had a particle with a mass with a specific mass and now you have a heavier particle because of your interactions in the in the in the in, in, in your system and if you want to uh, learn or understand the philosophy of emergence i would recommend you to read this very nice paper by anderson it's called more is different and where he shows that how uh how in a system if we have more elements by elements i mean the 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 unit of the system so if i have more elements in the system how their interaction emerges as a completely different property of the system so he starts from um, elementary particle physics and then he tries to show that how this emergence works and then finally he reaches i think social sciences so it's a whole lot of spectrum of subjects where he can connect it from the uh, elementary particle physics and explain it in terms of emergence sorry, uh, sorry for the interruption uh, yeah what, what is this u this one u 1 this is this is this is the, basically the uh, the u u is the coulomb repulsion between the two two electrons okay. so if i have I, I have a side two electrons try try to occupy that they will feel a repulsion between them that's it okay okay coulomb repulsion between the two uh, yeah two radius point which are actually uh, coulomb, coulomb, coulomb repulsion between two neighbor, electrons so two electrons neighbor uh, electrons not radius neighbor uh, electrons no no okay. no 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 it's not like that so i had a electron in my in one of the sides okay and then another electron tries to come in Okay. now when it tries to come into that atom it feels a repulsion and that okay. repulsion is actually very local it's not uh, not to the next neighbor it's on that side okay 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 got it got it got it thank you thank you please please go ahead, go ahead. yeah so uh, yeah uh, uh, yeah i was with anderson so if you read this paper this paper is actually very philosophical it doesn't do any mathematics but it's a very nice read to understand the philosophy of science So whatever, I go ahead, and um, so uh, now I will talk about this emergence and how it uh, comes in condensed matter systems. But um, I will not take the Heisenberg model. The Heisenberg model is really complicated. If if you uh, if you just see the, uh, I think I can go back. Uh, yeah. So if you see this. Uh, equation you see that these two are like vectors i'm talking very classically but these are actually quantum mechanical objects but let's say for the time being these are classical vectors and these classical vectors had a, a dot product between them and which is bit complicated for us to discuss here so we will make we will take a very simplified model which is called ising model and this model uh, these kind of interactions are very common in condensed matter systems so ising model says that the spins for the spins only the z component matter nothing else and this z s s z can take two values either it can be a up spin or it can be a down spin 
if it's a up spin we can say that the s z is plus one if it's a down spin we say that it's it is minus one and now we try to and we also say that in this case my j is positive and now we try to say that if i have two side i i have two sides and i have two electrons on them fixed that they don't move so they're fixed on on those two sides and then what will be the ground state so if we uh, try to find out the energies of this so i say in the two sides i have one up one down so up is one down is minus one so i put them in here i get a minus j if i take both up i would get a plus j and you can also say if if you are you're taking up down why not taking down up i mean it's the same thing and you you this is also true that those also have th that state also has a minus j energy and up up can also be down down that also has an energy plus j so my ground state is basically this one this one has the minimum energy and to call how this how to say how this arrangement is i would say this arrangement is anti-parallel by anti-parallel i mean if one spin is up the next spin is down so when i have a ising model with j positive i would always get an anti-parallel arrangement as my ground state now let's crank up the problem a bit we make it difficult we take a tetrahedron we, we take a tetrahedron and on the tetrahedron there is something i'm I'm putting under the rug, I'm not telling you, but in case of a tetrahedron that we are going to discuss today, the I SIZs can, can be not up and down, but in or out. So by in and out, I mean, if the spin is pointing inward the tetrahedron or pointing outward the tetrahedron. And if it's in, I would say it's plus one. If it's out, I would say it's minus one. And if I try to uh, place the spins on my tetrahedra, a tetrahedron, I would end up getting a configuration like this. So these two spins I would call in, and these two spins I would call out. So these two are going in, in the tetrahedra, these two are going out of the tetrahedra. Now this is one possible ground state of this system. So if I have interactions like this, and they will point like that. This is one of the possible ground state. And now if you look at it, so how did I do it? So I said this one, I fixed that out. So the next one is in, they're anti-parallel. By anti-parallel, I'm not, in this case, it is not like the physical vectors pointing to pointing opposite to each other. It's like if one of them is out, its anti-parallel configuration is in. So that's it. So I had a out, then I had a in, and then as I had a in, the next one is out. But now we have a problem. We understand that these two electrons are not, these two spins are not anti-parallel to each other, though they are neighboring. And also, if you look here, you have two spins which are both pointing inward, but they are also adjacent. So something went wrong. I, I said like a minute back that you must have anti-parallel alignment, but you had something else. And that's where the concept of frustration comes in. So frustrated magnets. And I'm just going to take a detour and make it uh, I try to explain it in one slide in the, in the next one. So what is frustrated magnet? So we basically have, now we start with the same Ising model and we know that the adjacent spins should be anti-parallelly aligned. I take a square, I put a up spin here, I get a down spin here, I put, I get it, so if, as it was down, I put it up here and as, I, as it was up, I put it down here and now I check and check here and i see that this one is up this one is down so all of the bonds here the, these are the bonds i'm calling the bonds all of the bonds here have anti-parallel spin element up down down up up down down so everything is fine but life is not that simple if you have a triangle now 
So I put an up spin here. I put a down spin here. And then as it was a down spin, I tried to put an up spin here. And once I put it, I see that, oh, this one doesn't work. These two are not anti-parallel. Okay, maybe I had made a better mistake. So let's try it again. I put an up spin here. I put a down spin here. And then as I see that this one is an up spin, so I fix this one first. I put a down spin here. But now this one doesn't. Again, I These two. Again, a question. Uh, yeah. Important question. Uh, all these things are happening uh, for internal magnetic field only, or there is a role of external magnetic field in this? Model? There is absolutely, absolutely no external magnetic field. Okay. This happens without anything. Okay, okay, okay. So there is no external magnetic field. Everything internal. Everything internal magnetism. Everything is every, every, so. Uh, yeah, ev everything is internal. So you mean the field applied by these two on the, this one? Okay. okay yeah. Okay, okay, great. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, we got it. So this is the thing that. So this is what we call frustration, and this is actually a very uh, general concept in physics. So when you have a system and it has a lot of interactions, and you try to find out the ground state and then you find, okay, you have a ground state, but some of the interactions are not satisfied. By satisfaction, I mean uh, some of the interactions have this kind of high energy state. So you would say that this system is frustrated. And this is very common in condensed matter systems. And this is one of the prominent uh, research topics in condensed matter phys physics because of the following reason. So when you add quantum fluctuation to that, I mean, now your spins can mix together and uh, so basically you add quantum mechanics to it. The, till now it was very classical picture, and now I add quantum mechanics to it. But now your states can mix and for that you get a lot of very exotic uh, quantum magnetic states and there that is uh, that is very interesting to us say for example one of them is called quantum spin liquid and this quantum sp and why this thing is important because of the same guy anderson said that uh, he actually proposed it that this quantum if you can establish a quantum spin liquid in a system that can be a pathway of giving you high temperature superconductor so you understand this is not only a topic of academic interest but also it has a huge implications in uh, in modern technology and all and this is the system this is the topics that i work on this frustration and spin liquids and exotic quantum magnetic states and that's what where i work on that's what my expertise is and i think i will continue in working on that okay so we come back to the tetrahedron so our tetrahedron is similarly you can take uh, uh, okay, so one thing I missed though. So if you still don't believe that you cannot satisfy your bonds, your all your bonds in a triangle, you can try it with a pen and paper. You will get six configurations, I guess. Six is the right number. You will get six configurations and in all of them, they will have the same energy and you will not be able to satisfy at least one bond. You can try it. So you can try the same thing on the tetrahedron also. And you will find that the minimum energy state that you can get is where you have two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out. And that's what we call the two in, two out state because two spins are in, two spins are out. And you can also get a 4C2 possible configurations. You can try it out. And all of them are similarly frustrated that two of the bonds will not be satisfied. And they will all be two in, two out. So we call it spin eyes. And there is a reason why we call it spin eyes. This has a very similar structure as a water eyes. I mean, the crystalline water. I mean, the eyes you have. If you look into the structure of water eyes, you can see that in the middle you have oxygen. And then from the oxygen, there are two hydrogens that are really nearby to the oxygen. And there are two hydrogens which are lying far apart from the oxygen. So that's why 
this also has a similar structure two hydrogens are in i mean close together and close to the oxygen and two hydrogen are far from the oxygen and that's why this is also has a two in two out configuration similar to this one that's why we call it spin -ups. that's a fancy name nothing else okay so now i will have a pause and uh, uh, i will ask if if you have any questions and jahir if there is any question can you uh, read them out yes 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 so one nilanjan roy is asking uh, only yeah. are you considering only spin half particles uh, or spin some different spin more than the half spin and yeah a, so yeah. yeah continue continue then i will come yeah if you, you 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 complete your question first yes uh, then uh, he asked uh, why for tetrahedron they have to align that way only means okay uh -huh. so first of all uh well i have talked about spin halves because that's easy to explain but this doesn't have to confine to spin halves you can go spin one spin three half whatever you want a very large spin also doesn't matter frustration is there if you if you choose a system properly you will always the the beautiful thing about thing about spin uh, half is when you have spin half you actually have a lot of quantum fluctuation so you can think about it in this way that you have an up spin and then you flip it completely to the to the to to, to a down spin this is a lot of quantum fluctuation when you you have a large uh, spin which is which uh, I, I don't know if you can see me fully it's like a like a vector and then a fluctuation to that would be a would be like going from uh, mz equal to s to mz equal to s minus one which is a really small change whereas for spin half it is going from up spin to down spin which is a lot of effect so due to this thing when you consider spin halves you are most likely to get uh, the biggest uh, um, effects coming from frustration and quantum fluctuation and that is what gives you this exotic state but uh, I mean I, I have worked on systems with spin three half also where uh, quantum fluctuation can do great things so it's not confined to spin halves. the other question uh, why the on a tetrahedra these things have to point in this particular way well you don't need to you can put them in the other for whatever way you want but you will still get the frustration but this pointing in and pointing out thing comes from uh, a thing called a uh, crystal field so i mean it's it's going I, I, it is a very it's a somewhat difficult concept so if you have a spin somewhere here and then there are some non magnetic ions uh, around which produce some kind of a electric field on this and that actually decides that where in which direction the spin should point so in this tetrahedron that which i take as a part of a different uh, whole big lattice um the crystal field is such that your spins has to point along that line either inward or outward but i don't want to go into that detail so i said i am putting this under the rug and then i then you ask the question so i i hope it's clear now so another question is uh, the emergent particle of which we are discussing uh, which came from the hubbard model by where is the yeah. original spin of the electron the question is not very clear to me so not can you just little uh, elaborate your question thereafter uh, so Please elaborate your question a little bit. Uh, another question is: uh, Is this any relation between superconductivity and this model? That is an interesting question, I guess. Ah, superconductivity and this model. Okay, so I mean, I still don't went into the model, but you can actually get superconductivity out of it. So, if you if you can establish a, a, a spin liquid and then from there we have a connection between the super uh, superconductivity and spin liquid so in principle you can get a spin superconductor from there but it's not um, it's not always obvious 
Right, but there could be a one-to-one -one correspondence from this model to superconductivity, these electron-electron uh, uh, interactions, mm -hmm. and both are you, normal. You can have different feedings and stuff like that. So from the Hubbard model, you you can actually ex try to explain uh, the superconductivity, but that's not always guaranteed. Okay, okay, okay. And one more one more basic question is, uh, someone is asking is what is quantum fluctuation? One two sentences on that. Would be good. Uh, so uh, a quantum fluctuation is basically say. Uh, as a zero zero point fluctuation that you uh, I, I don't know what is your level of expertise but I think it's zero point fluctuation of say a, a, a potential web I mean uh, what, what do you call that uh, so a harmonic, harmonic oscillator the harmonic oscillator or infinite potential well at zero zero temperature there should be a minimum yeah. energy for the uncertainty from uncertainty principle or basic quantum mechanics that is quantum fluctuation where yeah, that's basically the ultimate. And if you if you look at the at the Heisenberg model, so if you can expand the Heisenberg model in terms of x x z z and y y, the x x and y y term is the one term fluctuation term that can pin. What what operator would you would you act on that to make it down? You put a s minus. Minus is what gives you a gives you this flipping of spins, which is a quantum fluctuation. But if you apply SZ on that, the up spin remains up spin. You, you can't move it. So it's always in the quantum magnets that you have a quantum fluctuation. But I guess uh, Somnatha had a question. Yes, yes, yes. Somnatha's question is more interesting. We'll come. Uh, Somnatha, Shogotokona. So okay. Oh. Is, uh, is asking a more important question, I guess, that why spin in antiparallel configuration have lowest energy? Spin, spin, is okay, yeah. energy should minimum that is paramagnetic for J greater than zero. So that is a basic uh, thing in your model. I mean, I said J positive. So if my, I'm, I'm making a mistake, no. If J is positive, then uh, you have a up spin, you, you have a down spin. So up spin, we would say is the plus one and down spin, we would say minus one. So if I plug them in here, I get minus j when i have a up down configuration so, so that's why that this question i think more basic that why this the sign of j is positive or negative by which uh, this is determined i think he is asking them that oh okay uh -huh. i mean so if if you if you start from a hubbard model you always get a get a negative sign uh, i think i'm right about it yes and but there are other uh, mechanisms via which you can also get uh, anti-ferromagnetic interaction. There are other ways of getting a ferromagnetic interaction, and there is other ways of getting a, a getting a anti-ferromagnetic interaction. So there are many mechanisms lying behind which can give you a uh, give you a ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic uh, interaction. So the Hubbard model always gives you a ferromagnetic interaction, but I'm starting with the anti-ferromagnetic. To explain this, I start with the anti-ferromagnetic interaction. Well, so to get get a, get a frustration that I was trying to explain, you need a anti-ferromagnetic interaction. So that's why I chose anti-ferromagnetic. In my, I am not an expert on that, but what yeah. I, I need to add one sentence that in this exchange correlation interactions, uh, the sign can be a positive or can be negative uh, depending on the lattice structure, uh, I guess. Means, uh, for that's why some material is ferromagnetic, some material is anti-ferromagnetic, some material is yeah, magnetic. Yeah, I mean, exactly. What is exactly, the difference? Yes. What is the difference? The crystal structure, electronic structure is the only difference between them. So, the lattice and electron complicated structure makes them either parallel, positive or anti-parallel, negative or, or the sign of J. I think that depends on the electronic structure more, all the exchange correlation. J doesn't only electronic structure. This depends upon a, upon a lot of lot of things. Yes, but electronic structure is one of them. Yes, electronic structure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, since we choose has an interaction some point it comes from the from the RKK I mean I don't want to go into jargons but there are other mechanisms that can provide you with I mean the, the exchange path also is important that you to take which path to 
conduct to interact have a magnetic ion here you have some non magnetic one sitting in the middle and there then there is another magnetic ion to Wait, connect uh, with this uh, one uh, another another um, uh, yeah. question i think that is addressed uh, more important question is is it tactically observed all these things that we are dealing or it is still in a model phase ah uh, if frustration has been observed yes observed in many any systems and what i am taking is basically a is one tetrahedron and i don't believe that that is even possible to talk about one tetrahedron but there are lattices with more than one tetrahedron and more than one triangles and say for example a triangle a lattice kagome a pyrochlor which i'm going to go into these are all observed things these are not uh, this these these are not my thought by my brain child okay 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 uh, got it and uh, i i think yeah, there was one question about the spins right yes 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 uh, somnath jalal was uh, he elaborated yeah. a little bit so i so, i think he he knows the answer but <laughs> let's so uh, i mean the yeah, spins yeah, so, are Prata, are you are you seeing the uh, youtube in your mobile no no i i don't want to do that okay okay, that okay. so i am i am just telling it out so he is asking that from hubbard model one is getting heisenberg model where the spin are emergent particle but where are the original spin of electrons gone so he also he also written that uh, j is 4t square by u from that yeah, yeah. get the spin of sin of j or sin of yeah. u in the bracket but that actually overlap integral so yeah, yeah. he's asking something on that so what you can and do you can all you can see the comments also if you just open your mobile this mobile and that i mean I, my, my, i i don't have charge left in my mobile so okay okay, okay, okay. so i i i i i so 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 the, 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 so the spin part comes basically like when you want to occupy a site by two uh two electrons they will feel the repulsion definitely but they will also try they will also have to point up and down i mean this is the same energy level that we are trying to trying to uh feel so they can they can't be both spin up that's a pauli exclusion principle so when you bring in bring we have to bring in a spin of a different uh different spin so if it, if it was up then you have to bring in a down and that's why there is a spin interaction in there some somewhat and um, that's why you get that, that, that that's where the spin spin interaction comes in and uh, these spins are basically the electronic spins these si and sj are the electronic spins okay okay uh, another question is that the idea of spin out and spinning is not clear in the structure of water molecule so because you told ah, us respect to what what okay, fine water molecule doesn't have a, a spin in or spin out it's a, it's the hydrogens okay so let me go ahead yeah so uh, your red things are oxygens and then you have hydrogens so these white ones are hydrogen so in a in in one of the water this is one of the water molecule where you have a oxygen and there are two hydrogens which lie very close to the oxygen and then there are some hydrogens which are lying which are in connected to a different oxygen but there is a van der waal interaction between them so we also can con consider them as as somewhat connected to the uh, to the oxygen and uh, to to this oxygen and then if you try to draw a tetrahedron somewhere here you would say okay so there are two hydrogens which are connected to the oxygen which lie inside the tetrahedron and there are two uh, two hydrogens which also are connect somewhat connected to the oxygen but they lie outside the tetrahedron so that's why two hydrogens are in and two hydrogens are out so you can basically view it as a two hydrogens are close to one oxygen and two hydrogens are far from the oxygen okay 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 so uh, pratay uh, one last question uh, okay no, this
this is not a question. Okay, we will proceed to the next. Uh, half. Okay. I think the question. Yes, uh, one have more thing. One more thing. If the, if the interested readers or interested viewers have questions, see more questions or more clarification, you can always email Pratyar. Pratyar will give the email ID. Uh, so that is yeah. not a problem. So well, we'll proceed. I think. Yeah, we proceed. Yeah. So okay. So we have said what happens in one tetrahedron, and now we say we have a lattice of tetrahedrons. But before that, let's talk about the single tetrahedron again. So we took we took a, such a tetrahedron and we said that there are two spins that point inward and two spins that point outward. And we said that the in ones we will say plus one and the out so we will say minus one and then we can say that the sum over S J is plus plus minus minus plus one plus one minus one minus one so zero. So the total sum of the spin is zero in this tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. So now I have a lattice of tetrahedras and we call it pi reflow. So let's talk about the structure. So you have a tetrahedra some tetra tetrahedron sum of somewhere here, and then all of its corners, there is another tetrahedron that is there. So it has four corners, and at four corners you have one tetrahedron. So this is called a corner sharing lattice so you you have one one uh, element which is one tetrahedron and then it on all of its corner you have another tetrahedron and our job is to find out the ground state and we know that to the ground state of this system would be when we can make the sum of the spins zero on all of the tetrahedron and you can actually do that so what I did is basically this, I made this lattice and then I told them my, I wrote a computer program where I said that, okay, you put in a spin in there. So it did all of those and in all of those things, I calculated that what is the sum of the spins on all of the data, it is not the blue ones, but also the red ones. Okay, by the way, the blue and red has no difference. I just made them different colors so that you can understand. And then I, I, I said the computer that you calculate the total spin on each of the tetrahedra and it calculated and it spit out a lot of um, lot of possible configurations and I choose one of them for your demonstration. So you can actually do that. But the thing I said that it spit out a lot of configurations. That means that you have a huge degeneracy in in there so the ground state is hugely degenerate there are a lot of lot of states which have exactly the same energy and and um, and you, you you can think that and uh, when in the last slide i said that there are four c2 configurations in one tetrahedron so you can understand that okay so this is how the, the degeneracy will come but never try to try to think that you can multiply it by five and get the right number because there are some spin that are shared in two tetrahedra. So that's not going to work. You have to work it out and then you can find out what the degeneracy is. So whatever, but the bottom line is you can make a configuration where the total spin of the tetrahedra is zero in all of the tetrahedra. Okay, so this is the state that we call a uh, spin i state, and we are happy with that. We are not happy with that. We make an excitation on that. By excitation, I mean it's exactly like if I had a up spin. What is the excitation? I make it down. So in this case, if I have an in spin, what I do? I make the spin down. Um, I make the spin out. Sorry. So I choose this spin. And you, you you see that this spin is going in the blue tetrahedron, but it is going out of the red tetrahedron. So I'll flip it. I'll make it go out of the blue tetrahedron and go into the red tetrahedron. Oh. Yeah, that's what I did. I flipped this spin. This, this one goes in the other way around. This is my flipped spin. And as soon as I flip my spin, I put two, uh, one blue ball and one red ball here, and I'm going into that. Why? Why did I do that? So once I flip the spin, 
now the first question would be how how can you flip this spin what causes this spin to flip i would say the best thing you can do is to use a thermal fluctuation so you heat up the, your system a little, a little bit and when you do that one of the spins will absorb that energy and it will flip and once you flip it now you try to calculate the total spin in these two tetrahedra. So in the blue tetrahedra, you have three out, one in. So three minus one, one plus one, you get a minus two. And on this red tetrahedron, you get three spin coming in and one spin coming out. So three plus one minus, you get two. And this is a, this is not the I state anymore. So we, we have, we don't have a total SZ equal to zero in these two tetrahedra. We started it by saying that this is an excitation. Some people call it defect. But the cool people call it uh, magnetic monopoles. And this is nothing but an excitation. So, and why do you call it a monopole? I'm going into that details in the next slides. But before that, I need to define something. So I will not call this sum over spins SZ and sum over SZ. I forgot the sum over. Sum over SZ anymore. We will call it a monopole charge. We and we define. We will denote it by QM. This is my monopole charge. So I would say that this one has a monopole charge two, and this one has a monopole charge minus two, and that's why I def I colored them in two balls, and they're red and blue. Okay. So. Now, we, we have two monopoles, and what happens if, if we don't do anything? If we don't do anything, the quickest thing that this system can actually lose the energy, try to, so when you heat it up, it, it, it got heated, and then it doesn't want that heat anymore, it can throw it out. So if it throws it out, this spin again flips back, and we get back the same state we started with. We call it the combination of monopoles, we also call it the annihilation of monopoles, and that's fine. It recombines. There are there. You can always heat it up, and then it can again produce. It can again give you two monopoles. So this is basically a dynamic process. You have two monopoles. They combine. You get nothing, and then from there you can again get two monopoles. So this is a dynamic process. This is like a like a uh, liquid gas. Uh, based on the same thing. So you, you have a liquid, you have a gas on top, so some liquid goes, becomes gas and some gas becomes liquid. It's a dynamic process. And um, the other thing that's what interests us the most is that the monopole can move. So what I do did is I take this pin, this one, and I flipped it. And as soon as I flipped it, now in this one, I have total SZ again zero. So my monopole charge becomes zero here. But this one has a has a monopole charge now. So this one has three spins out, one spin in. So this, so this is where we have a, the, the monopole moved from this tetrahedra to this tetrahedra. And that's what interests us. But when it moved, you can see that this one had a charge two here. Well, mi minus two here. When it moved to the next tetrahedra, it still has a minus two charge. The charge doesn't change. So when two monopoles have been created and they move apart somehow, the charge doesn't change. Once you create a monopole, the charge remains constant when it moves everywhere, unless it recombines. So that's a different business. But when when they move, they don't. Uh, they didn't. They, they, they don't lose that their charge. The charge remains constant. And now, when you, we know that these things can be separated, now the important question comes: that how do you? What is the interaction between them? You you are always saying that these are monopoles. These are monopoles. But now we need to see that these really behave as two two magnetic um, magnetic. Uh, um, magnetic emergent particles which have a certain interaction between them and as I mean so I, I'm saying this this is QIM and QJM this is basically by saying that this monopole 
is at the ith tetrahedron and this monopole is at the j tetrahedron but there is no uh, no no other implication of i and j so i'm saying that in there are two tetrahedrons lying two tetrahedra lying far apart where not not very far apart where they have a, a monopole charge and i'm i'm defining that monopole charge as qmi and qmj so now uh, one thing that i didn't say you then didn't, didn't tell you is that the the spins in this type of pyroclose that i'm gonna I'm discussing has a dipolar spin interaction, which is not exactly like the Heisenberg, but slightly complicated. And the thing is, and the, Heis the Heisenberg that I was discussing is always the neighboring spins, but now the farther neighbor spins can also interact, and the interaction dies out as one over R cube. So I'm I'm not going into these details because this will make this talk very boring. And this is one fact, and the other fact is that the monopoles are not the pyro do not lie on the pyrochlor sites, but they they uh, they exist at the center of the tetrahedra. So if you take these two factors and then you do a very complicated mathematics, you finally get that this the these monopoles interact via a formula like this, which is so to say is very similar to the Coulombic interaction and I'd call that is the magnetic Coulombic interaction. So these are like exactly like two, two charged particles. The interaction is very similar to the interaction of two charged particles. But now you have two magnetic entities which also interact in the exactly the same way. So if you want to go into the details of this and how these things are derived, then I would suggest you to read this paper this is written by very prominent physicists and they actually explain all this and then you should also go to the references of this paper and i think there is one paper by uh, mike I, I forgot his full name but yeah so um, paper there are other papers uh, where you can uh, see that how these things have been derived and how they appeared they reached this conclusion that they interact in this way so we take this as a as a as a god-given thing where it says that the interaction between the monopoles is columbic and that's it so when you can separate these there are two monopoles which you have separated and now you can actually see that because of this interaction there is a magnetic field acting between them so they even if you pull them apart there is an inter a attraction between them very similar to the, the electronic charge uh, very similar to electric charges so that's why we call this as monopole and that's why my i say that these are monopoles that in the monopoles you can get as emergent particles well so once you so for, the the interaction between the monopoles i have shown i have shown you if you have monopoles you have created two monopoles and then they try to move apart i, I draw a line to show that in which say a, a arbitrary path it follows and then you can understand that once you have done that your energy required to move it further becomes really really small so once you separate them a bit then this one doesn't need to cost a lot of energy to move farther and that's what happens so when you can separate uh, one of the, the monopoles a bit maybe you reach somewhere here and then the other monopole doesn't need to the the, the, the red monopole doesn't need to lose or need to work a lot to move even farther so as it moves farther it costs it less and less energy so this is how it works and this thing if you have a very powerful microscope and you try to look into the system you could actually see that a trail of uh, flipped spins left behind when a monopole moves forward so if when a monopole moves as i showed it flips a spin and hypothetically if you have a very powerful microscope you can actually see the trail of this flipped spins 
and this is very very similar to what we call the Dirac string. So if you have a, hypothetically, if you, I mean, so the, so when when Dirac came into into the into talking about this, he said if we hypothetically have a, a have magnetic monopoles and we separate them, then the path that these things will follow would be called. It would be called a string, and people said, "Okay, this we should call it Dirac string," because of him. So that's it. This is just um, nothing else, no, not, no, nothing in details, but that's it. So, what I want to mention is that when you separate the monopoles, the monopoles can fly really, uh, really far from each other, and then at some point you could think that one monopole is basically an isolated monopole; nothing interacts with it. It's, it's, again, it's like uh, like the electric charge. So if you have a charge which is isolated from everything else, and it's the same thing when you have a magnetic monopole which is isolated from everything else, which is at, at infinity or something like that. So when you have that, these monopoles are not static. This will not stay at one tetrahedron. It will try to move. And sorry, was that a question? Oh. No, no, no. Yeah. no, 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 yeah. no, no. So, this would try to move, and as we can, as we see that each tetrahedra has four connected tetrahedras, so this will try to move in all four directions. However, there is a reason for which one of this direction is blocked. So it has three different directions, and I'm I'm telling you this because this is my area of research right now. I'll just touch upon it and come back. I'm not going into details. Don't worry about it. There is one direction which is not allowed and it can move into three directions. And the, the uh, tunneling rate, I mean, the, the monopole going from here to here is basically via a tunneling process. And this tunneling rate would depend upon the environment of, of, the, of the monopole. And uh, there are other degrees of freedom um, there, which could also manipulate the monopole dynamics, and that's what where I'm working on. And and I've I've, I've learned a lot about these things, but still, I'm not an expert. But I'm very overconfident about it. But um, well, that's what I'm working on. But now, I I will still now I have talked about theories and I'm very comfortable in those things but the next thing I'm going to talk about is the experiments which I I don't understand a lot but I will try to give you an overview that how experiments work so at this point if anyone has raised any questions Chahir. yes yes, yes. yes. one question is uh, why Ising model is more important even it cannot explain spontaneous magnetization but we will say this well I mean, I didn't get the question did, properly, did, but did I model it does not. I am not expert, so I should not comment. I mean, I if if I have a ferromagnet, it does that. Okay, so the question is uh, it does not stand out properly because he or no, I, I, mean, I I think the most important thing is to answer that why Ising model is important. Yes, 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 yes. That, that you tell one percent. Ising model is important because you have real systems with Ising interaction, and this is the simplest point where you can start and then uh, understand your physics and then um, go go ahead building things. I mean, I, I can I can give you and real materials which which poses Ising interaction, and and it's it's really really interesting uh, thing. So the uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I think model is. I, 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 I would say this is one of the most important models that you can have. I mean, this, this, this model is is beautiful, and uh, people don't. So this was my mistake when I was in my PhD. I never looked into the Ising model, and then when I came to my postdoc, I looked at it, and it's beautiful. I mean, it has a lot of things. It has. You can do stat make on it. Even if you look into the phase transition of it, there are a lot of lot of things that people don't understand. But these are important things. Okay, 
Next question is, uh, do the monopoles violate Maxwell equation? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes, in a sense, because you don't have, uh, in a Maxwell's equation, you don't have uh, mag magnetic charges, but now, now you have magnetic charge. So once you have your magnetic charge, your whole uh, electrodynamics has to be redefined. I mean, it's not violation, but I would say you need to uh, uh, re refocus them with uh, uh, with magnetic monopoles now. Okay, okay. <laughs> I think that's uh, one. Uh, yeah. One more important question is uh, Nitish Kumar is asking: Do these monopoles leave a hole when they move out of their location, just like normal electrons in a semiconductor lattice? <laughs> Uh, no, uh, it, it it doesn't leave. I uh, mean, by hole, what do you mean by a hole? This is not a hole. No hole in the sense of uh, the one to one correspondence, like in a semiconductor, the energy gap in your energy you state. The point, is there something? If you have a semiconductor, your electrons what was sitting on a site. So if it goes away from the site, now your site has a hole. But in this case, the monopole doesn't sit on a site. It sit in the tetrahedron. The sides are around it, but it sits in the middle. So when it moves from here to here, the sides are still filled. You you have spins on all of them, but the, the, your tetrahedra doesn't have a monopole. The monopole goes into a different tetrahedron. That's it. Okay, I think we got it. Still, if they can have a question, can yeah. email. The next question is, I think this is one more important question will be, why one direction is not allowed for the spin to be flipped? Or in other words, why the monopole cannot travel in one particular direction? Means it is an isotropy and an isotropy in the traveling direction of the monopole. No, 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 no. It's something very simple. So, uh, say I block this direction, You remember, if you remember. So when I would say the monopole comes from here to here, then you have to flip this pin from in to out. That is perfectly, perfectly all right. But now you have to look here. You have one spin out, one spin out, one spin out. Now this one will also become out if the monopole moves here. So you have four spins out in this tetrahedra. That is a very high energy state. So we started with two in, two out, and then a monopole is three in one out, I mean three in one out or three out one in whatever, but now you want a four out configuration which is even higher in energy. So that's why that thing is, I would say energetically not uh, possible if you are at a very low temperature, but I would agree with you if you are at uh, somewhat higher temperature, you can actually get that. There is a slight possibility that your spin can, uh, you, you can leave with, you, you can get back a get a tetrahedra with four spins out or four spins in and that is called a double monopole so this is a single monopole i was talking about that that is a double monopole because it has now total so the monopole charge is four or minus four now so as we are in low temperature physics we are not uh, thinking that uh, okay this is not possible so we say that this direction is completely blocked How the theory of magnetic frustration varies from pyrochlorine lattice and Kagom lattice? I'm not aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Kagom lattice. I, I don't know. This question seems like a very expert's question. So, uh, may, may I know who, who asked this question? Uh, this is Songkhunil Sarkar. He is a good student, I guess. I know him. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so this is a very nice question. So when you start from a 1D system, the 1D system and uh, so uh, in, a, in a 1D system, uh, your effect of quantum fluctuation and frustration becomes maximum. I mean, sorry, the, the, the effect of quantum fluctuation is maximum. So this is basically a Landau level theory that you, you you have a 1D system, you have more quantum fluctuation. And as you increase your dimension of your system, your quantum the effect of quantum fluctuation becomes smaller and smaller. And if you know, 
I mean, if you read Landau's uh, uh, argument, then you will find that at 4D, your mean field is right. You you don't need a quantum fluctuation anymore. So when you go from a 1D to you raise your uh, di dimension of your system to 2D to 3D, gradually your effect of quantum fluctuation decreases. But when you go from 1D to 2D to 3D, your effect of uh, frustration increases. So that's why there is a competition between these two and that play out a beautiful role and you get different exotic states. So say for example in Kagome, uh, I'm pronouncing it wrong, it's Kagome, uh, the, 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 the ground state would be a kind of a spin liquid. I don't want to mention the which kind of spin liquid, but it's a spin liquid. You go ahead in uh, and you you do you get a pyrochlor and now you can get a different kind of spin liquid, a, a, uh, maybe a Coulomb spin liquid, a quantum spin liquid. It uh, depends upon what kind of system you are choosing. So that's the thing. I mean, you can't really predict that what will happen, but you can actually say that the frustration will grow as you grow your uh, dimension and the quantum fluctuation will reduce as you go your drive go grow your dimension so there will be a competition between them and uh, you you will get different exotic things well yes. uh, hi brother uh, someone is asking the as rathi so he was yeah. is asking that if we uh, take a isolated monopole uh, I yeah think that, i think there should be an associated magnetic field if so can you use local magnetic probes or strength of the local and experimental perspective? Exactly. I'm, I'm going so, into that detail how, how experimentally you could uh, do okay, it. Okay, okay. He's he clarified more like strength of magnetic field associated with the monopole, say some kind of stay field, stray field, if it's yeah. yeah. just anticipation. He is anticipating if there is some kind of stray field in the monopole. Yeah. So you are going yeah. to okay. address this in the next. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so going into the experiments that how how do you do it? Okay, okay, okay. I mean, uh, what what he said is somewhat right, but still, uh, that would be technologically really really difficult to. Uh, we we don't have that technology in our hand anymore, yet, so that we can go into the system and precisely measure the magnetic field somewhere in the bulk. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, and one question is. Are, are the generated monopoles are connected and what is the exchange particle related with? Can we infinitely okay. separate the two monopoles and is there any inter, uh, interchange particles associated with the monopoles? Inter, inter, inter what? Uh, exchange particle like phonon, phonons or gluons or magnons. And okay, uh -huh. okay. Well, so in principle, if you have separated them, you can if, if you have have got, got rid of the initial Coulomb barrier between them, then you can actually separate them as far as you want. And that's why we are saying that we can create a create mo monopoles because we, we, we by saying monopole, we need to separate them infinitely apart. And we, this is possible. This is no, nothing that stops it from doing that. And the interaction, as I said, the, uh, even like electric charges, if you have two charges lying a large distance apart, still there is a Coulomb interaction between them. And similarly, even if you do that, do, do separate two monopoles infinitely apart, you will feel some kind of a, I mean, not infinite, I'm saying that if you, if you separate them by a, even a large distance, you will always feel uh, interaction acting between them. Well, the question about phonons and all, well, the phonon, uh, I mean, how would I say, the phonons actually sometimes help them move apart also. I mean, he is right in a sense that phonon can actually mediate coming back and, but phonons can, can sometimes mediate this tunneling and your monopole can even move further because of the phonon. Okay, we'll go to the experimental station. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, uh, I mean, 
I just said this thing that if you have um, have two monopoles separated out, uh, uh, then, uh, then the question was how was is it possible to detect them by a field? I mean, if I want a smoking gun, uh, I mean, if if I want a very uh, precise uh, measurement, if 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 I do calculate a magnetic field, no one would believe me. I mean, a magnetic field in a system can appear because of different reasons. Uh, but yeah, you you are right that if you have a monopole there, there will be magnetic fields coming out of it. Can you detect it? That's the important question, I think, because in a bulk where you have a monopole somewhere there, I think it would be really difficult to measure the magnet, mag magnetic field at the same point. Either you need a very powerful microscope or something like that because you know the monopoles are not sitting there always it can move it can move here and there and if you have a very local probe the, the you, what you will do you will have a system and then you will, you will try to scan through the uh, through the material and when you try to scan maybe the monopole fly in a different direction you could not find it so that's a problem of detecting the monopole very locally. What you need to do is to, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't think that this is even possible with the current uh, technology What someone would, would have come up with one of the ideas, but I'll explain you that what of what the experimental ideas we have in detecting monopoles. So this is say, this is not possible. So the next thing we can do is to do a smoking gun experiment. By smoking gun, I mean, uh, you. So if you have a gun, you fire it, and then the bullet hits the target, but you never see the bullet. Then how do you determine that which gun has fired? You see the which gun is smoking now, and that is called indirect proof, and that's how we will go ahead and detect monopoles. So the first thing that uh, we do is to, I mean, this is not me do my some of my collaborators do. What do they do is to create some monopoles in a system and then apply a magnetic field. And as these monopoles are separable and they feel the feel the magnetic field. So what happens that if you look into a into isolated tetrahedra, you see the monopole was somewhere here when the spin was pointing in this direction, going into this tetrahedra. And then as you have a magnetic field which is acting opposite to the spin this one flips and as soon as this flips this uh, monopole travels from here to here so when you ever you apply a mono uh, field on a on a system with monopoles the monopole feel the magnetic field and then they move according to the field so what happens if you have a field this they separate and they move in two different ways the, one of them moves far towards the field and one of them one of them moves backward and when you keep on applying the field for a for a, for a, for a few seconds for a few seconds you can actually see a monopole current generating in the in the system you can actually detect it experimentally and that has been done in many of these works these are rare earth spiro rare earth pyrochlorides where they have detected monopole current and from their monopole current they decided that okay so this is there, there are a lot of monopoles and they could tell you what is the density of monopoles and so on and so forth and i mean i'm i'm, I'm trying to exp I, I'm, I'm involved in one of these experiments as a theorist and i'm trying to explain their experiments and um, that's fine and uh, the second experiment is somewhat more interesting and this one is also I, I don't know this one would be one of the most prominent uh, proofs of monopole so this experiment says that you, if you have a system where you have monopoles and then you apply then you uh, put a coil here and as the one of the monopoles is traveling and i'm not applying a field or something this monopole is just traveling and tra when it's, it travels it comes somewhere near the coil then this would 
generate a current in the in the coil and if you have no you know the lens law then you would say okay so this is my uh, this is my monopole is coming in this direction so my current should be opposing the monopole so i need a current which goes this way then you use your right hand thumb rule and then you say that okay then my field would be acting on the uh, acting opposite to the uh, to the direction the red uh, monopole is traveling and it will try to push it back but when it crosses the coil now what happens now the field applied on the on the on the uh, coil is decreasing so uh, it will not li like that so it will try to pull the monopole back from this direction and now the field should be in such a direction that it pulls it back and then we again say we use the right hand thumb rule and then um, that's why my current should be still in this direction so the basic thing is when your monopoles come close to your coil and then goes past it there is a current generated in the coil and that that in both the cases the current generated is in the same direction so if it was the opposite direction then when it, when it was here it would have generated a current in this direction and when it passes the current would have been in the other direction that would cancel out but the, the beautiful thing about monopoles is when it crosses it actually induces a current in the same direction in in when it was before or after it doesn't matter but you would always say that this is a small current how do you how how can you detect it it, it will die out pretty quickly it will dissipate for that you use a superconducting coil once you use a superconducting coil no matter how small uh, the uh, just excuse me i need to put in my charger yeah so um when when you um uh, when you put a superconducting coil you even if you induce a very small current it will not dissipate quickly and it will leave longer and you can maybe come after two days and then see if your if one of the monopoles have passed your uh, coil or not i mean this is one of the experiments and this idea uh, okay so yeah just I, I just want to say that what happens if we have a have a mag not a magnetic monopole but a bar magnet or say an electron like that but, but say a bar magnet so if i have a bar magnet and then i do the same thing the bar magnet comes in the the current want to oppose the oppose the north pole so it will be in this direction and once it crosses you have the current moves in the other direction because now it need to pull the south pole back into the coil so the, if you know this is how you generate your our ac current so we take the magnet we fluctuate it in between and the current direction always changes and uh, changes on each move and then you get your ac current okay so this experiment has been being set up in cern and they started it i think in 2012 and then in 2016 they came out with this paper explaining all these things that they want to detect monopoles and and things got uh, really excited in our community and because they said that we, they, they they want to do it in condensed matter systems also but somehow they published a paper this 2020 20 in january and there they have detected magnetic monopoles but those magnetic monopoles are not the condensed matter monopoles these monopoles are really high energy monopoles i think at some point they will be they will be switched where they will think of doing this experiment in the condensed matter system also i am hopeful about that but the bottom line is they have been able to detect monopoles though they are very high energy monopoles. so i have come to the end and uh, what i want to say is to, to conclude the things so first of all what I said is there is the magnetic monopoles are not elemented particles, but you can see them as emergent particles, and that helps us. Pyrochlor is such a system where you can create monopoles, the pyrochlor can possess monopoles, and then you can separate them and you can have different experiments in 
in detecting them and uh, lastly that if we have monopoles uh, in the in, in in our in our world now then this will actually ha actually we have to redefine our electrodynamics including these things and that's a whole new horizon of um, of a theoretical physics fundamental theoretical physics and also experiments moreover this can be somehow be important for the uh, for the technological things you know i mean we had electric charges we made electricity we light up a bulb now we have magnetic charges we do something and we do something else so this is also has a technological uh, direction that you can think of it so with that i end and if you have any questions fire question. them now. yes question yes question yeah some echo is coming my voice i'm here i'm hearing my voice yeah. Um, yeah, my, from my side okay. my no, no no not your side not your side this is from mm. something technological well uh, question is we need magnetic monopole to solve that <laughs> question is uh, they say one speed is clipped over by thermal agitation but is exactly how can we say that this is exactly one there can be two or three spin clip because of thermal agitation so is it oh yeah. Like this? yeah 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 exactly i mean uh, if if you flip two or three spins you actually create more and more monopoles that's good for us so there is actually no way of creating i mean you need a then you need a very tiny uh, tiny uh, i don't know something where you put a thermal fluctuation only at one site but i think that is also not technologically not possible but let's say we don't do it we do it very thermally so we put the system on its on a oven and heat it up and then you create a lot of monopoles so you create a lot of monopoles you create a lot of double monopoles you create a lot of defects but the good thing is uh, when you try to relax them some of the monopoles are left behind so first the double monopoles go away and then some of the monopoles are left behind so it's not always one you can create a lot of them Nowadays, local magnetic probes like diamond magnetometry are under development, down to femtotesla mm -hmm. sensitivity. Uh, so okay. Can you comment something? Or is not asking a particular question. He's just I mean, asking uh, your comments on that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, if if you can, I mean, I what I said this is currently it's not possible, but if it's possible that you can detect it in the bulk uh, very precisely, then it's brilliant. I mean. This is possible then. Uh, he's just asking their comments. That is, a, is it a femto Tesla sensitivity? The magnetic probes are there, or is it under? I mean, I, 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 I have no, no idea. I mean, if it was there, some, someone would have said that that's how you detect magnetic monopole because that's the, that's the ultimate goal. I mean, you detect an electron, you detect a magnetic monopole. It's the same thing. Yes, yes. The my, I am adding one question to you. My yeah, yeah. So if, if you can reach at that sensitivity, that femto Tesla sensitivity for uh, magnetic probe somehow, then yeah. uh, then now uh, what can happen from this magnetic monopole perspective? I mean, I don't know it that what you can do with it. I mean, you are talking about what advancement we can make in the technological sector, no, right? No, no, no. If we can make that technological advancement, then can we? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, 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 yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm not saying that this is impossible to detect. It's it's possible to de detect, but right now what we have is always the uh, indirect approach. So if you have that, uh, if we get the technology in our hand, then it's definitely detectable. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, one final question is uh, when you were seeing current, some uh, in, uh, someone is asking that when we asked hmm. about when you talked about current. So is it a spin current only you are talking about or something else, charge, not electrical current was there, right? only spin current? I mean, which, which one, the experiment? Uh, no, spin current you told in the theory section also and this experimental Okay, yeah. Also. Spin current, well, this term was used, I also remember. Uh, 
this would definitely be some sort of a spin current because your spins are flipping so as you apply a magnetic field your spins are flipping when you go forward um i mean i'm i'm not disagreeing to that this is sort of a spin current definitely but um, yeah i mean this is so, so sort of a spin current yeah uh, okay 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 fine 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 uh, would you recommend some books uh, basic books for bsc msc be not be, uh, people who are interested in magnetism along you can read along to know some books well I, i i would say you read uh, i mean i mean for not for the bsc students i can say something about say master msc student, master student second year yeah, MSc MSc students basically you can read uh, the book by mahan m a h a n or you can read the book by ah i forget the name okay uh, or, uh, or back yeah or back email Ma email mahan yeah, yeah, or yeah. back or back you can send me an email and then i can tell you okay okay, okay. that's fine that's fine no issues because for a pronunciation you can be confused so exact book yeah, name you will i'll write your name yeah yeah so fine. that is fine uh, so well uh, we are almost uh, at the end uh, of our discussion so one more question uh, from my side uh, i will be if we if the magnetic monopole exists so will it break down all this uh, electromagnetic formulation which we already have or will it work within this electromagnetic theory formalism what we have right now maxwell's formalism what we have right now doesn't have a magnetic charge yes so if we can mean, have really in 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 reality i mean in not in reality in in the in the in the in the in the common space like everywhere else it still holds but maybe at some point where you have monopoles in a in a say you make some kind of a conductor where you want to i mean i mean a magnetic conductor where you want to move these monopoles then a whole new things you have to de you have to develop you have to define your uh, electrodynamics in new ways definitely or else you can't do it okay okay Uh, A.S. Rathi is also saying that uh, point is magnitude of magnetic field associated with monopole, means which he was asking. We are uh, talking about this femtotesla sensitivity a little earlier. So uh -huh. he was uh, he is once again telling that uh, his point is the magnitude of magnetic field associated with monopoles. Uh, can you comment on the magnitude which will be associated uh -huh. with the magnitude of this monopole? So if there is a that magnitude we uh, can build in the uh, model then the experimentalist I, I, can go to detect at that level of sensitivity that was his point actually i mean i, I understand what he is trying to ask but i cannot have those numbers on top of my head but uh, i i i would ask you uh, to send me an email and then we can talk about this because i don't have those numbers on on the top of my mind okay okay Uh, it should be a theoretical model to have a magnitude estimation of that uh, magnetic monopoles right in theory yeah, yeah, I, we, we should have a we, we, we have that thing but those numbers are i, I don't okay, remember okay, the numbers okay. that is a, not an issue but if we have that estimation and if experimentalist can go at that level of sensitivity then i guess uh, the thing will be uh, done means dood ka dood aur pani ka pani there is another point i think which which needs to be mentioned that we need to go into the bulk it's not a surface thing it's yes. not a surface property yes. we have to go to the bulk and detect it yes 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 and that's to and that's to okay so i will you uh, want to add something else or we yeah, i i don't have anything else so you can write to me if you want and uh, i will be happy to answer And, and i would uh, request I mean, you to send uh, this presentation in email uh, to me in a pdf format so that i can upload it somewhere okay. and interested okay. people can download so that will be done yeah. that will be done okay okay uh, finally both i will switch over to your face you did not show your face yeah so. exactly that's what i was thinking of <laughs> so in the initial Am the, I? Yeah, yeah yeah yes 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 yeah. So you can Okay so yeah it, it was 
thank you for inviting me it was nice but i didn't know i had to answer so many questions i never expected that many questions <laughs> no people are smart smart people are there so yeah. i'm very glad i'm very glad <laughs> so very smart okay. people are there <laughs> so we have a wonderful talk we have a wonderful session so thank yeah. you pratap for a wonderful webinar and wonderful uh, talk and in future we can expect you one, one more time as your research will progress you will be with us yeah I, I can talk about different things but yeah so i had to hide everything what i did in my research because those things are super complicated and i was talking basically the things that uh, that are very well known and and very general for the general audience yeah. so thank you thanks for in inviting me uh, salvis call it a day yes 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 we will end it we will end it thank you thank you for this thank you to the students thank you to you also so okay prata bye bye we will end this up okay okay okay, okay. okay.